happy to be here. So, you know, usually when I'm asked to come to these things, I usually decline because, you know, how relevant am I to these things? But in fact, this time I decided to accept it. It's only for one reason. About 30 years ago, when I was about the age of most of you guys, I was developing nuclear sensors in Paris. And we have a small team doing a lot of fun. And I had a bunch of friends next door. And one of my friends was one morning saying, oh, come on, come on, look at that. And he just received a new software. And we spent the day playing with it. And we thought it was really, really cool. And it was ANSYS. That was my first introduction. It was, I'm not really sure. I think it was 85. Half of you were not born, most likely. But <laughs> <laughs> and in fact, during this period, I remember months later, I was in, uh, in Connecticut in another research lab. And another guy come and say, come on, I need to show you something really, really cool. And it was MATLAB. I was wondering, damn it. Spent all this time in calculus for that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and, but I remember these two days with a lot of, I guess it's nostalgia now. And that's why I decided just to come here. So what I'd like today is just tell you about what simulation means for me now. Not what it means for you guys, but what it might mean for you 25, 25 years from now, as you make it through all the ladder and have to wear a tie. <laughs> uh, but first, uh, let me tell you what we get on. You know, Baker Hughes is one of a, what we call integrated all service company. The fact that we integrate all service company means that we do, we make, we design tools. Uh, depending on the business, we sell them or use them to provide a service. And we cover about all the life of a reservoir. In fact, in some cases, we all, and you know, there is a few of these companies, but we just basically do all of things. Uh, in our case, it's about 20, slightly lower than 23 billion in revenue, about 60,000 people. We spend in uh, R&D about $500 million a year. 550 this year, and it's growing slowly. And this is really R&D, you know, into that. There is no, like many companies put sustaining and things like that. This is pure R&D. It's new products. If you modify an old product, it's not part of it, or it has to be a real modification. So that's really what it means. And we do after that, obviously, and we cover all the things. But because we are an integrated old company, we do cover all the life of it. And you always have to remember what kind of business we're in. You know, many people are mechanical engineers, electrical engineers, but at the end, you know, our business is very simple. Nature has stuck hydrocarbon molecules down in a small pore, and usually it's far away. And our business is to take it out, or help our customer to get it out in a tank somewhere so he can refine it transport it, do whatever it is. This is really our business. So it always starts with a reservoir. So when I think simulation, I first think about something which has to do with a reservoir. Because this is where it all starts. Remember, anything we do is about getting this molecule and making sure it gets to a tank. And sometimes the pressure is so high that we have to keep it down and safely. And we know that if we don't do it, we've seen what happened in Gulf of Mexico a few years ago. Sometimes the molecule is stuck to the pore and doesn't want to go, and you have to pull it out, push it, whatever. But it's always about that. And that's why many times in this business, when you think of simulation, first you think about that. And then you have to start thinking, like, OK, what do I need to do about this now? But it is about. And you know, we speak about data. You know, the way it starts is people, you have a geologist, and they put together maps. And then you do seismic. So imagine now, uh, the biggest land cruise now, you put about between 100 and 200,000 geophones down. You sample them usually at 2 milliseconds, digital at 24 bits, and it's run 24-7 for a couple of months. Well, once, you know, big data is very much in fashion now. This is really big data. <laughs> And then you have to do something out of it. And then from that, you take it piece by piece until you start understanding. But you know, later I'll go to, I would say, a more classical example. And then I try to think of, to discuss about what are our challenges. But we should just not forget, in the oil business, 
it's always start. It's all of, uh, always a piece of rock which is holding some hydrocarbon that we want to get out. So we have an environment. To reach that, we drill wells. And we have the most extreme, you know? They're not all as extreme, but you have conditions. But basically, temperature go to 200 C plus as we go forward, and 30,000 PSI plus. This is where we go. And on top of that, you have all kind of chemistry which is happening. H2S, things. And you have geochemistry, because remember, when you pull out hydrocarbons from a well, you change pressure, you change temperature, the whole thermodynamics change. So things happen. You know, you have scaling. The whole molecules, the hydrocarbon gets together. They make asphaltine, stuff like that. Anything happens. And it is changing all the time. So it's not just mechanical. You know, as you go in, you realize that a lot of it is about interaction, evolution in time, and chemistry. Whatever you design, we'll see so many changes that you have to take that into account, which make it even simpler. So here's an example of many. This is a classical example. This is what everybody does, you know? On one, you have a turbine, and you have the flow that goes through it. On one of them, you have a sub, a joint sub in drilling. And you know we put stress sensors on it to try to measure it and take it up. It's an LWD tool, which basically what you put is you put a probe against the formation, and you pull the liquids from. And obviously, we always try to do it before we put in a well, because you try to simulate all that. But this is things that we do all the time, and it's evolving. You know, the interesting part is, which was still struggling part, is when you take a measurement. So here you have a patch. It's not all the same tool. But basically, you know, on the left with colors, you know, out of this measurement, sometimes you have what we call resistivity measurement, but you have many of these. So we inject a current into formation. And on the other side, you have a sensor that gets it, and you pass it through electronics, and it works. And if you try to simulate that, it works really well. Now, the issue in the real world is that the surrounding is not homogeneous. You have many layers. And the minute you get in layers, these models get in trouble. And then man, now you don't even drill vertical well, you drill horizontal wells. And the layers stack this way. And then if you have a permeable zone on top of it, the resistivity change because you have a mud into it, etc. And this becomes really a mess. <laughs> Which means that the way we have to go around is, and most of the solution that you find. They're not unique. You can't invert them. So when you design a tool, not only do you have to design that, then you have to design your sensors. And then you have to add measurement until you can reduce. Because what you do, you build an inverse model and try to invert it on it. And then you try to reduce your unknowns so that you can solve it. And then only once you have done it, then the easy part is pass that through an electronic diagram and get the final response. <coughs> but where we're really struggling, again, is about physics. You know, if you don't understand the physics, you just don't get it. And so remember, I know that I heard that you want everybody to be able to design anything. That really scares me, you know, because <laughs> <laughs> I don't want anybody to design my stuff. <laughs> I want the guys that design my stuff that see the simulation, and because we are not there yet, that understand that, yeah, this is, does it really make sense or does it not make sense? It's still a tool. For me, you know, it's still about people. I first choose my engineers, and then I let them choose their tool. It's not the opposite. And maybe a few years from now, we'll be there. But this is purely multiphysics, and this is a very simple one. You know, there's still many of these formations that we don't really understand them. But we still use a lot of that. You know, this is a connection in a drilling tool. It's shaked, vibrate, pushed, and we want to see when it's going to break. And the good thing is we simulate it, and then we do it in real to test it. Because, you know, none of my customers will trust me that they say, OK, you can go. My simulation tells me to work. They'll just laugh to me, at me because obviously. <laughs> so I do have to test it. But it is true that in simple cases like that, it does work pretty well. And in fact, the predicting lifetime, the predicted lifetime and the one we measure <laughs> do get together. And it does help us to go much faster. It is true that it helps us to get our design focused, and we have to do this test once or twice, not 10 or 20 times. So obviously, there is huge 
efficiency gain when you do this kind of thing. This is another one which is interesting. You know, this is a safety valve that you have to flap when you, these are some very, very high productive. And it looks super simple. But when you look in details, what you realize is that the speed of the flow and the scale change every time, so you have really to check it. But when it's closing, it goes to a supersonic speeds. And in fact, in this, this looks very simple. But in reality, we are the only one which has one working at this conference, which is nice. <laughs> but something so simple, and it is true that we could only succeed. You know, you have two ways of doing it. You can design many, many of them, or you can really push your simulation and do it. And again, then you have only to qualify a couple of them. We spoke a lot about pumps. But this is a nice one. And you remember, the issue with our pumps is if you get in an offshore, you know, we all speak about the cost of it, and it costs basically between 100 to $200 million to drill them now. What we always forget is, once we put an ESP pump, and you start it five years later, if it breaks down, it will cost you between 50 and $70 million to change it. It's obviously not the cost of a pump. I love that we can sell them for this price. But the cost to the customer to just change a pump is above $50 million. So we really don't want it to break down. So here we see one, this is abrasion, because obviously when you pump you have sands and stuff like that. Now there is another issue I'll tell you. This is good, it helps us, but if I look at my pumps, what breaks down at least as often, even more often than this part, which we cannot master pretty well, is a motor. And in my case, 50% of my motor breakdowns are due to temperature failure. I know the, the way I solved it is, finally, I had a bunch of my guys that came with a new insulator that will resist much better temperature. And these guys are chemists. And they don't use ANSYS to simulate that. So you still have some challenges, you see? Uh, how do you design a polymer which is whole long enough? Because into a inside the motor of a pump, you know, it's under temperature, but then you do generate a lot of heat internally and you don't have much space to cool it down. So basically, the heat that goes in the motor is at least 30 to 40 degrees C above what, what we have every day. And this is the things, kind of stuff that we are not able to simulate yet. So it's a nice challenge. It's all about materials, and we still have to do a lot of work on this one. But we do use material, you see, so this is basically a packer. And most of these different materials are different elastomers. And we're able now to simulate pretty well how we do. But still, you know, the component of the material, when you do it, we still have to input into the system the material, and we have to do experiments. Like I said, chemistry and physical chemistry is still something that it would really help us if we could go much faster, because in this case, we still have guys that mix all these things. Think with the brain, or say, okay, this is probably the best one, and we test many of them, and then we put big tables, and that's the way we function. So all these domains, because now, you know, our tools are all become more and more complex. And it's, you know, if you just want to think of one, you remember that the, the dream liners has been delayed quite many times, and Boeing really ran in trouble. And you know, they, they saw that after the 777, where we could design the whole plane, basically, and simulate the whole without really building it, they could do it. But here you had some, you know, the minute you speak with organic components, for some reason, we get in trouble. So you have two ways, you know, in your design, try to avoid organic components. <laughs> and if you can't, well, we still have something to do about it. So this is another one which is uninteresting, a mod motor the simplest mechanical piece we have in. But you know, the real issue here is in lifetime is, it's a rubber. It's an interaction of the rubber with the whole thing because you have mud that goes through it, you have sand. And you know, the steel, steel is okay, we can simulate that. But the rubber, we can't. So in this model, we are still forced when you do this simulation to enter by hand tables, you know? You have this kind of mud, this is absorption speed to which we love. This is what might happen to the rubber. And then you enter that into the simulation and run it again. So this is a good challenge, you know, guys. 
I would love to be able to get my robot composition in my simulation, couple it with my mechanical simulation, and run it and see what's happening. When will I have to have something that chopped out, etc. And then to finish, you know, if you think of where is it I spend most of my time now on simulation. So here I put something that looks like this is un unconventional. So we have an horizontal well. This is an open hole completion. It could be with cement. And you see we induced a big frack in the middle that you see this vertical stuff. And it will interact with many natural fractures that exist here. And while you inject, what you frack, what you do is you inject the fluid in there. You will open these fracks. And you will create basically an artificial permeability matrix, which will vary on time. And you have to think of it, you know, now. We all speak about the, the big unconventional revolution. So, you know, what people don't always know is that when we go to this place, an average for the industry, we will drill a well, we'll complete it, and we'll frack it. And we'll frack many zones. We'll frack, you know, from 10 to 40 zones at maximum. Uh, but in reality, we will really produce from about one third of these zones. Depending which industry statistics you take, it's between 30 and 40 percent. Which means that we don't produce in any reasonable way from two thirds of what we do. This is a big inefficiency. And the difficulty, you uh, have many ways, but you know, I'm a physicist, I'm not an engineer. So for me, you know, if, if I understand something, I can model it and simulate it. If I can, that means I don't really understand it. And really, if I do something and two thirds of it is not really producing, I cannot say I really understand what I'm doing. So we have a big effort now trying to understand many things, but at first, what you have to find, it starts with a rock, you know? You bring a, a fluid with pressure and you induce a fracture. And this fracture will interact with existing fractures. You'll open it and you create something that will flow. We are totally unable now to simulate that in reality. You know, whatever we do is very simple models and when we do some effective ones. But then it's more complicated than that because once you do that, then you'll have a fluid that will go into it. You have to carry a, a propent so that these fractures don't close back, and you need to deposit them. And then on top of that, whilst you flow, you'll bring new fluids into it. If you bring water in shells, they will, the shells will take the water. Uh, you bring new chemistry, which means that you will change the chemistry. Things will dissolve, films will aggregate, we have to be able to simulate that all, because if not, if we cannot simulate all of that, we'll continue to do basically things in the dark, do it in a geometrical way, and producing from about one third of what we do. I know we always speak about efficiency gains. You know, the biggest inefficiency for me is doing something that is not producing. And think of the price. You know, an average cost of a well now in the US for shales is about, I don't know, $8 million average. Some are deeper, you know, if you go deeper, but, and you spend about 2.5 million for drilling the well, and then you spend five to six million between what we call the completion and the stimulation. And think, completion and stimulation take six million. Two thirds is not producing. If we can make all of them producing, or if, like, if you can only complete and frack what is producing, we should reduce the six million to two. It's probably a little more than that, but basically, this is the big efficiency game that we have. Because remember, we do 20,000 of these wells a year in the US for now. That's a lot of money. <laughs> That's a big price. And also, again, at the end, you know, it's, uh, you have to think of the cost of this. You know, it's very hard to get exact cost of these wells. But I mean, but, you know, really, to bring to the surface a barrel of this oil is probably anywhere between 50 and $80. So it's OK when the barrel is at 100. Imagine it goes down to 75. We'll be in trouble. So we need to solve that. That's a big issue. The other big issue that we have in the industry, and we all touched it, is it's the deep offshore. You know, it's not sustainable. Imagine that, you know, I have 
we serve more than 10,000 customers. Uh, if I just take the top 20 that I serve, next year they'll spend $100 billion just in the activity which touched me. But you know, the big issue, if you look over the last, I forgot exactly, 15 to 20 years, you know, these guys, have, their ENP spent has gone up by 400%. And we only increase the production by about 5%. So we are, on a, we are going somewhere which is not sustainable. Think of it, you know, like I told you, it costs 50 to $70 million to change a pump. This is not sustainable. So what's the solution? We have two, point, two solutions. Or we find a way to do, basically, to bring down the cost of intervention. And we're working on it. The other way is to put down a completion that you don't need to touch for 20 years. Because it's not, it's obviously not. But not to touch something for 20 years is complicated because first it means that you need to find the right materials, you need to find the right electronics, so that it will live for 20 years. But then it's more than that because in 20 years the reservoir will change, like I say. You will pull liquids out of it, you will inject stuff in it. The whole thing will change, the chemistry will change. You need to be able to act on it, which means that you need to design the completion which not only survive 20 years, but can open, close, but also measure what's happening. It has to measure not only the flow, it has to also to measure the chemistry. It has to be able to inject chemistry so we can treat what's going on. You know, if you have scaling, it, sound, it would sound, how could you say, natural logic to detect it, to detect the first signature of scaling and inject the right treatment directly into it at the beginning not wait until you get it on your FPSO and find out. So all of that is a big, big issue to design that. And again, <coughs> to design it without doing it 20 times, we need to be able to simulate it. So I think that, you know, we have a, you guys, if you take that into account, you have a nice future in front of you. <laughs> and I'm looking forward to coming in, in 30 years more to do a talk like that. <laughs> So that's what I had to tell you about, about how I see simulation, really, from my point of view. Thank you.